the Word of Faith Netcast is on the air. Well, praise the Lord. This is Dr. Bill Bailey, and this is the Word of Faith Netcast. And I'm glad you could join us this week. We've got a very special program for you this week. Uh, it was recorded live at Faith and Victory Church, and it's a very important topic, one I've been talking about here for uh, several weeks now. Uh, we had a little break there while we had Pastor Keith Moore from Branson, uh, Missouri, come on, but he was even talking about some of these particular topics. But what I want to talk about through this teaching that we're starting this week and will continue for the next, basically this netcast and probably two more beyond that, uh, I got a little long-winded <laughs> on this particular Wednesday night service at Faith and Victory. But at any rate, uh, this is an important topic. The title of the topic is Greasy Grace Don't Slide In. All right? Greasy grace don't slide in. The greasy grace doctrine is what I call, it's my reference to, radical grace teaching. And we look at it from a biblical perspective and we look at it from the perspective of the person that has been the major teacher of this particular doctrine. And I want to show you what the Bible has to say about what they're saying. So we're going to go directly into that teaching right now. Greasy grace. Now I call it greasy grace. You, you know, Pastor talks about uh, radical grace, I think is the term that he likes to use. And actually, the people that are in the movement that, are, you know, that I call greasy grace, uh, they call themselves radical grace followers. Um, now I thought it was interesting that they call themselves that because the word radical, if you look it up, in Merriam-Webster, it is defined as very different from the usual or traditional, extreme, favoring extreme changes in existing views, habits, conditions, or institutions. So it is radical grace. Now keep in mind, and, and Pastor's been teaching on some of this, so a little bit of it will be slightly repetitive. I, hopefully I'll come at it from a little different direction than he's been coming from it. Uh, as you might imagine, a little more uh, PhD-ish <laughs> direction. I did a lot of study on some of these things and references and so forth. But um, the thing about this radical grace is that it's important. It's a key thing that we not forget that grace is biblical. There is a teaching concerning grace that is biblical, and that's what Pastor's been doing. As a matter of fact, I appreciate what Pastor's been doing, teaching on the book of Ephesians as he has been from chapter 1, verse 1, all the way through, line upon line, precept upon precept. That's the way you, you do it. You answer bad teaching, incorrect teaching, with sound teaching. Because when you hear the real, the counterfeit is easy to spot. And that's exactly what they do uh, for retail establishments to try to train them how to recognize counterfeit bills. They literally have them handle real money so long that when they then touch the counterfeit, they go, oh, that's not right. They immediately recognize it. And so that's what I want us to always keep in mind. There is a legitimate teaching concerning grace. There is an accurate teaching concerning grace, and that's what pastor's been doing, and I think that's really important. What I'm going to do is look at some of the beliefs of this particular movement. Now, there's a couple of things that have struck me as I've seen this whole Greasy Grace movement teaching come about. And by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll mention this. I call it Greasy Grace because it's easy to slide in unless we're diligent, okay? The main person that's teaching Greasy Grace Doctrine, Radical Grace Doctrine, is a guy from overseas, and he claims, he says, that he learned most of what he learned from Kenneth Hagin, that he's a word of faith preacher, and he approaches it from that perspective. And many people who are challenging what he teaches 
challenge it because they say, well, see, he's just a word of faith guy. I beg to differ. He is not a word of faith guy. As a matter of fact, if you listen to what he says, he goes on to say, I'm out beyond the word of faith message now. I appreciate Brother Hagin, but I'm now out beyond that. Well, you know, if, once you get out beyond the Bible, you're too far out for me, okay? And if you're out beyond Brother Hagin, I, I can truthfully say you're too far out for me. So there is a difference between word of faith teaching and the greasy grace teaching. And it, if you excuse me calling it that, I just like to call it that because it just suits me. <laughs> All right. Here are some of the main doctrines, teachings, of the Greasy Grace Movement. Now listen to this. All teachings of Jesus in the New Testament, that is in the Gospels, are before the cross and therefore are Old Testament and therefore they do not apply. Okay? Now, here's what I want to keep, you, keep in mind about this teaching. Um, remember that in Genesis 3.1, and actually, let's go ahead and put that verse up there. Genesis 3, 1. The devil was described as subtle. Now, in the King James, it's spelled S-U-B-T-I-L. The current spelling of subtle is S-U-B-T-L-E. But it's the same word. And it says, The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said? Did God really say that? Uh, yea, hath God said, uh, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Well, God didn't say that. He said, don't eat of one tree. You eat of all the rest. But the point is here, this Hebrew word, translated subtle, is arum. That's how you pronounce it. It's a transliteration of the Hebrew. And it means cunning, usually in a bad sense, crafty, prudent, and subtle. Now, the thing you're going to find about false doctrine, and particularly this false doctrine, is it is subtle because there's an element of truth in what is being taught. Grace is valid. Grace teaching is valid. Some of the things he's saying are valid, but he's carried them to an extreme and gotten over into error. Okay? Now, let's look at that first doctrine. All teachings of Jesus in the New Testament and the Gospels are before the cross and therefore Old Testament. Now, that is true to a certain extent in this regard. Jesus ministered as an Old Testament prophet. However, he wasn't just an Old Testament prophet. He referred to himself as a prophet. He talked about the prophet's ministry. But that's not all he was, and it's certainly not all he is. He is the manifest Son of God. He is the Word made flesh. What he said in his earthly ministry carries more weight than anybody else. You see what I'm saying? You can't say, well, he ministers an Old Testament prophet, therefore everything he said doesn't apply to us, which is what this guy is saying. Well, how could that be? Jesus is the very Word of God made flesh. John chapter 1. So we know that. And we know that he said himself, Jesus said himself, I don't say anything except what I hear my father say. I don't do anything except what I see my father do. In other words, I'm not here representing myself. I'm not here uh, with my own opinions. I am saying what the Father God said. Well, give me a break, folks. That means whatever he says is straight from God. It's not filtered. It's not covenant-based in regard to Old Testament, therefore it doesn't count. Besides that, that is really a misunderstanding anyway. Old Testament, therefore it doesn't count, is not correct. The Old Testament says, thou shalt not kill. <laughs> Amen? That is a commandment. And actually, the Hebrew is very plain. It says, thou shalt, shalt not take innocent life which is why it is erroneous for people to say, well, the Bible says thou shalt not kill, so we should be against capital punishment. No, the Bible says that the state bears the sword in order to punish evildoers. But if they're evildoers, they're not innocent. And the verse says thou shalt not take 
innocent life. Well, who is the most innocent? An unborn baby. And I, you know, I'm amazed at people who tell me, well, Dr. Bill, how can you be against abortion but for capital punishment? It's simple. Innocent life, guilty life. And if the state does not bear the sword in vain, then I'm sorry. They're going to have to pay for their transgression against the state. Now, won't God forgive them? Yes, God will forgive murder. And they'll be forgiven as they are executed. <laughs> because the state does the execution, not God. It's simple. It's simple. There she went. <laughs> Clunk the sacred cow just fell over again. Matter of fact, I think she jumped up and fell over. <laughs> All right. Next doctrine they teach. Greasy Grace Doctrine. God no longer judges or condemns anyone. Okay? In other words, the teaching is that Jesus bore all sin, therefore all sin has been destroyed, therefore there's no sin left. He took care of it all. And the teaching goes something like this. The sacrifice of Jesus was for the entire world and covered everybody in all sin. Is that true? Yes. So what's the extreme? The extreme is to say then, well, since that's the truth, then nobody can sin anymore. Nobody has responsibility for sin anymore. I can sin all I want to, and it doesn't matter because Jesus already covered it all. See, that's the extreme, and that's the error. And you can, you can demonstrate that. As a matter of fact, we will very shortly from Scripture that that is completely <laughs> wrong in every sense. All right, next doctrine. All reference to obedience to God or his word is legalism and therefore bondage. Okay? They teach that if, you, if I were to come to you and say, well, you've got to obey the word, oh, that's bondage. No, no, no. That's wrong. Wait a minute. If I'm reading the word of God and the word of God says to do something, then I should obey his commandments. And... and there's nothing wrong with obeying his commandments. There's nothing evil about obeying his commandments. Matter of fact, not obeying his commandments comes from a, a bad premise, and we'll get to that as we look at the scripture in just a few minutes. Next doctrine. There is nothing we have to do, and I put do in quotes here because that's the key word they focus on. There's nothing we have to do as believers anymore. Church attendance, tithing, confession of scripture are legalistic. If you were to tell me, now, Dr. Bill, in order to operate by faith, you have to speak the word. That's legalism. I don't have to do that. I can succeed without doing that. Well, I'm sorry, the Bible says you cannot succeed without doing that. Oh, you mean I've got to do something? That's legalism. No. Doing something is obeying the word of God. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Doing what? Deceiving your own selves. Uh-oh. <laughs> These folks are deceived. They're literally deceived. All right, next doctrine or teaching. When Jesus bore our sins on the cross, past and future, all sin was completely destroyed. Therefore, no one can sin anymore. Now, this one gets me. I, I, I encountered a pastor many years ago. Now, I'm not talking about a guy who, you know, was some country preacher that didn't have a lot of education. This guy taught Greek in a Bible school. He was very well educated. He was extremely committed to the Word of Faith message at the time. Now, this was back a year, this was back in the 80s. This was a long, long time ago. However, he came to me one day and he says, Brother Bill! It is impossible for me to sin. I said, is that right? <laughs> um, I disagree, but why do you think it's impossible for you to sin? Well, I'm out beyond sin now. I am now so forgiven and so living in God that I just don't sin. And I, I immediately said, what about pride? That's a sin. Amen. That's what he was doing. He was operating in pride. 
<laughs> yeah, or he was already dead and gone on to be with the Lord. Well, he was standing there. So now, I, uh, I mean, I'm a teacher. Teachers see in black and white when it comes to the Word of God. That's just the way it is. And so I said, uh, Pastor so-and-so, here's what the Bible says. And I just rattled off a bunch of scripture. He looked at me for a while. He says, you just don't understand my revelation. I said, apparently I don't. <laughs> and apparently I don't want to. <laughs> now, it wasn't a year or so later that he ended up having an affair with his church secretary, lost his family, his children, his church, but he couldn't sin. Now, see, the problem with false doctrine is it will lead you down a road where you will do the very thing that you think you're not capable of doing. He got in there and, and the church secretary was like, you know, my husband doesn't love me. He doesn't understand me like you do, Pastor. And they were in the church by themselves. Uh-oh. And so uh, before too long, they're headed for the hotel. Well, you know, that's sin. The Bible calls it adultery. If they weren't married, fornication. But in this case, both of them were married, so that's adultery. That's sin. Now, can they pray and, for, and get forgiven? Yes. But that, that really is, in this case, isn't the point because he was convinced he couldn't sin in, in the first place. Anyway, this is part of what they're teaching is saying. Now, Part of what they're saying as well is that, uh, and as a matter of fact, I've got this a little later on, but I'll go ahead and mention it. First uh, John chapter 1, in other words, little John, so as opposed to gospel of John. First John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 are a verse of scripture that this guy likes to harp on, this guy who teaches greasy grace. So let's go ahead and put that up. First John chapter 1, verse 8, we'll start there. It'll be 8 and 9. If we say we have no sin, <laughs> we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Well, that covers that guy that I just talked about, right? Let's go to verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, this greasy grace teacher says that verse of Scripture cannot apply to Christians. Okay? Although 1 John, very clearly, if you look at the chapter, is talking to believers. Now, as pastor has pointed out, it has to be talking to Christians because to get born again, you don't confess sin. You don't have to confess and enumerate every single sin you've ever committed. Thank the Lord. I'm glad that's the case. What do you have to do? You have to do what Romans 10, 8, 9, and 10 says. What saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach that. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The word sozo, saved, delivered, healed, protected, made whole, spirit, soul, body, financially, socially, and delivered from all temporal evil. It's an all-encompassing word. The point is, though, you confess with your mouth Jesus as your Lord. You believe that God has raised him from the dead, and you're saved. You don't have to confess sin. But once you're saved... Now you have to maintain a relationship with the Lord. Now I'm not saying that if you commit a sin, kick the cat, kick the dog, that now you're going to hell. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is sins will clog up the pipe between you and the Lord. It's the best example I, I can come up with for this. As you commit all these sins, and typically they're... they're little sins. I hate to use that type of terminology, but you know what I'm saying? We're not talking adultery here. We're not talking murder. We're talking, okay, maybe you did kick the cat. Maybe you meant to, maybe you did. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or you lied, or you misrepresented something, or whatever. Well, if you do not confess that as sin and get it out of your life, that will start clogging up the pipe between you and the Lord, and you will lose fellowship you're not, not born again. You're still going to heaven, but you lose fellowship. So what 1 John 1, 8 and 9 is for, is for believers to keep the pipe clear. It's the Drano scripture. Oh boy. I know there's a lot of people going, what? What do you say? 
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins as we commit them, remember what Brother Copeland says, when you sin, don't run away from God, run to God. And that's not when he finds out about it, when you confess it. He already knows. So go to him and say, Father, forgive me, I have sinned. I don't want this to get between you and me. So I want you to forgive me as your scripture says. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The cleansing of all unrighteousness clears out the pipe. And then you have that close, intimate fellowship with the Lord. Okay? That's what that's for. This guy says that that scripture was written to the agnostics. Or, I'm sorry, agnostics. The Gnostics, which were people that were a false doctrine in Paul's day that believed only in what they could see and touch and taste, you know, the five physical senses. They didn't believe anything beyond the five physical senses. They wanted only knowledge, and the more mental knowledge they had, the, the further advanced they thought they were. Okay? So he's saying this what scripture was t just talking about Gnostics. It wasn't talking about Christians. And the Gnostics weren't born again, so therefore it's not, it's not talking about people that are born again. Now, why does he say that? Because he just does. He made it up. Now, the, the, the Bible says here, if we look at 1 John, I'm going to go here so I can, can look at it here in my e-sword, e-sword.net. <laughs> Verse 1 says, from That which is from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, which our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested, and we, 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 hello, have seen it and bear witness. Who bears witness? We. And show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us, us who, believers, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you may also have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and his Son Jesus Christ. Who's the our here? Believers, the church. With that we've seen, that we've heard, we declare unto you that you may have fellowship with us, true our fellowships with the Father, with his Son, Jesus Christ, and these things write to you, unto you that your joy may be full. This then is the message we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we, believers, say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Who do you have fellowship one with another? Believers. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Who's he talking to? Believers. But if we say we have no sin in our lives as believers, isn't that what he's saying? We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. These folks that are teaching greasy grace don't believe that they have to deal with sin anymore at all. Therefore, they have deceived themselves and the truth is not in them. That's harsh, Dr. Bill, to say the truth's not in them. I'm sorry, that's Bible. I just say Bible. <laughs> I'm not giving opinions, I'm just giving Bible. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Who's the word in? The word is in a believer. Amen? So this chapter is so obviously to believers, you would have to have help to misunderstand that. And I believe the Greasy Grace crowd has help. First, they have a false teacher that's helping them. And secondly, devils. Okay? Doctrines of. <laughs> oh my, I tell you. All right. A Christian can accept Christ and live a life of sin and for the flesh because they're already forgiven and there's no need to leave, live holy and blameless lives. This is what the Greasy Grace folks say. As the Apostle Paul admonished us to do in 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, where he said, For God has not called us to impurity, but to consecration. Oh, oh, there's a word they don't want to hear. Consecration. Oh, man which is to dedicate ourselves to the most thorough purity. This is, by the way, the Amplified I'm reading. Therefore, whoever disregards, sets aside and rejects this, disregards not man but God, whose very spirit, whom he gives to you, is holy, chaste, and pure. Let me go back and read that again. 
out of the Amplified. For God has not called us to impurity, that's sin, but to consecration, to dedicate ourselves to the most thorough purity. That kind of does away with the preacher that thought he could go out and have an affair and still preach and be anointed. Sorry. Therefore, whoever disregards, sets aside and rejects this fact, disregards not man but God, whose very spirit whom he gives to you is holy, chaste, and pure. In other words, he's not ignoring Dr. Bill saying this. He's ignoring God saying it. Well, praise God. I hope you're enjoying this message. We're going to pick up again next week and continue this message that was recorded at Faith and Victory Church. I want to encourage you to let people know about this teaching, this particular netcast and the two that will be following it because you need to hear this message. Also, I'm going to post a link uh, in the show notes to this video that will give you a link where you can download the entire message, the entire audio message of this particular topic. And I want you to share it with people, record it, put it on an MP3 stick, send it to them by email, however you want to do it. Get the word out about this particular topic because I believe it's going to be a tremendous blessing to folks to hear the truth concerning this radical grace teaching. Now, we're just about out of time. Let me give you our email address and our mailing address. First of all, our mailing address is Word of Faith Ministries, P.O. Box 5213-5213, High Point, North Carolina, the zip code 27262. And then, of course, our email address, if you send it there, it comes much faster than via regular mail. So you can send that to Dr. Bill, D-R-B-I-L-L, at W-O-F-M, that stands for Word of Faith Ministries, W-O-F-M dot O-R-G, because we're a nonprofit organization. I'd encourage you to go to our website, W-O-F-M dot O-R-G, check out the articles, check out the resources we have there, and, for instance, the link to this message, Greasy Grace, don't slide in. Check that out and share it with folks. Share the link to that message with folks, because I believe it is an important, important, a vital message. So join us next time. Remember until then to fulfill the Word of God.